now up to Columbia. The book of James chapter 1 reminds us that trials are a testing of our faith that produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Let's hold strong to our faith, continue to love one another, and we will persevere together. Let us pray. If you are a praying person, pray with me, please. Almighty God, we come before you today and we give you thanks for another day of life. I ask your blessing upon our country and our state. I pray that you would provide wisdom to our state officials and leaders. Be, be with our medical professionals, teachers, first responders, and all of our state agencies who are leading and serving during this difficult time. Lord, I pray for the people of South Carolina that we would love one another and pursue unity and peace. Lord, lead us, guide us, and protect us from all evil. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Chaplain. <clears throat> we have two things to talk about today, and we appreciate you coming. Uh, one is about money, and the other is about a vaccine. Uh, you know all of those things have been in the news. As you're aware, the Accelerate SC Task Force has played a vital role in the safe and swift revitalization of our state's economy. And we are confident that we are doing better than a lot of our other, a lot of the other states are doing because we've made good decisions, collaborative decisions. The official recommendations and guidelines produced through Accelerate SC and the public effort have allowed our state to gradually and responsibly remove the limited and targeted measures enacted to combat the COVID-19 virus. One important charge given to Accelerate SC <clears throat> excuse me, was the conduct of a, th a thorough and complete review of the Federal Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic Security Act, that's the CARES Act. They were also tasked with providing expenditure recommendations to my office for the $1.9 billion coronavirus relief fund that included the CARES Act for the reimbursement of South Carolina COVID-19 related expenses. On June, the 9th, on June the 10th, I provided the General Assembly with recommendations based on those from Accelerate SC for the first phase of expenditures of CARES Act funds. Those recommendations included replenishing our state's unemployment trust fund, providing resources to DHEC and the Medical University of South Carolina for statewide testing and contact tracing, also, the creation of a statewide stockpile of PPE for the future and funds to reimburse schools, colleges, and government agencies for COVID-related expenses. <clears throat> Today, I have provided recommendations. You may have a copy of it there. For the second phase of expenditures, of the Coronavirus Relief Funds, CRF, from the Federal Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, the CARES Act. That is, these are the set recommendations for the second phase. <clears throat> First, the Unemployment Insurance Trust Fund. In order to prevent our state's small businesses from paying higher taxes to replenish the Unemployment Trust Fund, I have recommended that an additional $450 million be authorized and made available to the Department of Employment and Workforce for the Unemployment Insurance Trust Fund. As you know, in the first phase, I asked for and the legislature provided $500 million into that fund. Second, for small businesses, <clears throat> I have proposed that $30 million be made available in the form of one-time $5,000 grants to small businesses, that is to small businesses that did not receive federal funds under the Paycheck Protection Program loans from the Small Business Administration. A lot of money went out under that program, but it's a lot of our small businesses did not receive that money. That would be enough money, that $30 million, to provide 6,000 small businesses in our state with a $5,000 grant, which we are confident would be very much welcome by all. Also, for certain nonprofits, I have proposed a similar grant for certain nonprofit organizations that were not eligible to receive 
the PPP loans because of their unique tax status. For example, a nonprofit like Riverbanks Zoo here in Columbia was not eligible. And while they were closed to the public, they still had to pay the employees, keep the place clean, take care of the animals. My proposal would provide $15 million to provide nonprofits like the Riverbanks Zoo with the relief they would have received under the PPP loan. As for schools, for many South Carolina families, public schools provide the opportunity for parents to work, provide housing, meals, and economic security for their children. They're literally, their lives revo revolve around those schools. The, when the children are in schools, that allows the parents to do many other things. And of course, we know how important it is for the children to be in school for a variety of reasons. Many working parents just simply cannot stay home with the children every day, but they still, they have to go to work. They have to feed the families, provide shelter and security for their future, their medical care and everything else. If a parent wants to send their children back to school or if they want to keep their child at home, they should have their choice. Uh, they shouldn't have to choose between their child or their job. 19 school districts began this school year with their classrooms open five days a week. However, a large number of school districts chose not to provide parents with that option. Parents are not happy. I am not happy. I don't know anybody who is happy about this. I, my office, among others, has been flooded with calls from parents and concerned citizens as well as emails and letters, and there's a sense of frustration all across the state about this. If state law allowed me as governor to require school districts to provide in-person instruction five days a week as an option, I would have issued the executive order months ago. I have no authority to require the school districts to provide face-to-face -face education to the, to the children, no authority. What I can do, however, is to help those schools who have, which have opened for face-to-face -face education with the cost of doing that. The costs of in-person of in reopening are significant. And so I have recommended to the General Assembly that up to $50 million be authorized to reimburse public schools, districts, and charter school author, excuse me, and charter school authorizers for COVID-19 related costs incurred by those schools reopening and providing five-day in-person classroom instruction to the students. South Carolina's economy is returning to normal because people have returned to their workplace following precautions designed to keep them healthy and working. I believe that schools are no different. I believe that by following, by following official COVID-19 procedures and protocols, schools too can be reopened safely and sensibly, the same way business, manufacturers, restaurants, merchants, and state government have done and are still doing successfully today. And we announced some time ago and made it doubly clear to all the school districts if they need the protective equipment, we will provide it at no cost. Many have asked, some have not. But we do not want the lack of the protective equipment, the personal equipment, to be a reason for not allowing those children, those parents, to send their children to schools. Finally, I have proposed an additional $93 million to be directed to DHEC and MUSC for continued and expanded COVID-19 testing as prevention, as well providing reimbursement to state agencies, counties, municipalities, first responders, law enforcement agencies, public institutions of higher education, and technical colleges for COVID-19 expenses. As you know, the General Assembly will meet next week to discuss CARES Act funding, among other issues. It is my hope that just like they did in June, they will adopt these recommendations and the state can put these resources to work to provide the needed funding and relief right away. Second point 
is about the vaccine. I'd like to mention that the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, known as the CDC, as you know, are rapidly making preparations to implement large-scale distribution of COVID-19 vaccines in the fall of 2020. The vaccine distribution program is expected to be a public health effort of significant scale potentially involving hundreds of millions of vaccine doses to be distributed across the United States. In South Carolina, the Department of Health and Environmental Control will coordinate the distri distribution of this vaccine when it reaches South Carolina. Similar to the hospital bed surge plan that was formulated back in the spring, the vaccine plan will be a Team South Carolina effort and will involve the participation of numerous state and local agencies, health care providers, the National Guard, the Emergency Management Division, and everyone in between. I've asked DHEC to provide a brief overview of their planning and preparation for distributing this vaccine when it arrives. And we know that the, the, the initial shipments will begin and then others will follow. It will take time. but. I've asked them to answer your questions about the vaccine and provide an update also on the nursing homes and assisted living facility visitation plans. And Director Marshall Taylor, if you please. Thank you, Governor. Well. Good afternoon. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all of our public health professionals, countless partners, essential workers, and many others who continue to work around the clock to protect the health and safety of our residents across South Carolina. It's because of their tireless commitment and dedication that South Carolina can be hopeful that we will bring this virus under control. I'd also like to thank Governor McMaster and the legislature as well as their staffs for their leadership and their support of our important efforts to fight this disease. So first, real quick, I wanted to give a, an update on nursing home visitation plans. Uh, we have received to date 46 of these plans from facilities across the state, uh, and we have approved 24 of these plans. Uh, we have five that we're waiting for additional information uh, from nursing homes on. We are working very closely with the Nursing Home Association and these facilities across the state to get their plans submitted to us and get them back out to the, to the facilities so that visitation can start across South Carolina. It's very important that this happens soon, uh, quickly, so that uh, people can see their relatives and visitations can begin in the facilities that qualify uh, for, for visitations to occur. With regard to vaccines, as many of you are aware, there has been increasing national attention on the development of three different vaccines uh, aimed at helping to end the spread of COVID-19. DHEC and our partners are working closely to develop a plan for distributing a vaccine within our state once one becomes available. The plan will be built on guidance and recommendations from CDC and the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and other federal agencies. As a reminder, there is no confirmed date when a vaccine will be available. However, as we learn more, our team will provide the public information as that information becomes available. In lieu of a vaccine, we must continue in our united fight against this deadly disease by remaining vigilant about taking recommended precautions, including practicing social distancing, wearing a mask, and know the status, your status by getting tested. I'll now turn the floor over to Stephen White, who is our Director of Immunizations, to provide more information about our planning efforts. Thank you, Director Taylor. Good afternoon. So most of you, as Director Taylor has mentioned and the Governor has mentioned, have heard a lot about COVID vaccinations on the news and over social media over the last few weeks. Each day, with each person who enrolls in a phase three COVID-19 vaccine trial, including right here in South Carolina, 
the medical world is learning more and more about three promising vaccines being tested here in the U.S. I know we are all hopeful that one of these vaccines will help put an end to this unrelenting virus that spreads without symptoms, literally stealing the breath from our loved ones and neighbors, colleagues and friends, not just in South Carolina, but also across the country and across the world. Although we don't know exactly when the vaccine will be made available in the United States, I want to assure you that DHEC is forging partnerships and following federal guidelines for developing a plan for distributing the vaccine within our state when it becomes available. This plan will be built on the guidance and recommendations from the CDC, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, and other federal agencies. The South Carolina Emergency Management Division, the South Carolina Hospital Association, the National Guard, South Carolina State Law Enforcement Division, Department of Labor, and other public and private sector partners are working closely with DHEC to develop South Carolina's COVID-19 vaccination plan. The overarching goal of this vaccination plan will be the equitable distribution of the vaccine across the state. We, just like you, have heard that an improved vaccine could be made available as early as this fall, and we will be ready. There are things that I would like for you all to know. One, we have been assured by key scientific stakeholders like the National Institutes of Health that no vaccine will be released until it has undergone the rigorous scientific and clinical testing that all vaccines in development are held to. Second, when the vaccines first become available in, in South Carolina, the numbers of doses will be limited. These limited doses will be allocated according to federal guidance to those at highest risk for contracting the virus and those at the highest risk of death. These groups include, one, our frontline medical personnel, including those individuals who provide care for our senior populations in nursing homes, two, residents in nursing homes, and three, critical infrastructure employees. As vaccination production ramps up and additional vaccines complete the approval process, we are being told that there will be sufficient doses available nationwide that we will be able to open up vaccinations to the general public. The vaccination is a two-dose series, which means individuals will need two doses of COVID-19 vaccine in order to provide protection against COVID-19 disease. Timing between the first and the second dose is currently unknown. However, assumptions are we could be looking at 21 to 28 days or even longer. Individuals that receive the first dose will need to receive the same brand of vaccine for the second dose. Our current COVID vaccination planning process and timeline will continue to evolve as more information becomes available to us from the federal government. And as we learn more, we will continue to keep South Carolinians updated on the status and availability of COVID-19 vaccines and our plan to make it available to the far reaches of the state as soon as the supply allows. Remember, the first doses of the vaccine will be available for those at highest risk for developing severe complications and death from COVID-19, as well as the medical professionals and essential workers who are routinely exposed to the virus every day. There are many months to go before the vaccine will be available in mass quantities, months that will be especially difficult as families plan for holiday gatherings while continuing to protect those most vulnerable. During these challenging times, as we wait for the vaccine, there are things we can do to make sure that we get to the finish line together. One, we encourage everyone to please continue to wear your masks when you're around others, even while outdoors. Please maintain at least six feet of distance from others. Please avoid group settings, especially in indoor spaces and make sure you wear a mask and socially distance if you must be in a group setting, even if outdoors. If you don't feel well or have symptoms of illness, including mild symptoms like a sore throat, a cough, 
or headache, please stay home. And lastly, please get your flu shot. Finally, I'd like to remind everyone that currently more testing opportunities, opportunities rather, are available in South Carolina more than ever before. We have more than 540 permanent and mobile testing locations and the turnaround time for the results is increasing, is becoming faster and faster as time goes on. We encourage anyone who thinks they should get tested to get tested and anyone who is regularly out and about in their community and in close proximity to others because of work or other reasons to get tested routinely at least once a month or more. Please take advantage of the testing opportunities that DHEC and our essential partners have made available because it's never been easier or more accessible and testing remains a critical part of this fight against the vaccines. Thank you. Okay. Don't go far. I'm not. <laughs> Are there any questions? Go. Yes, ma'am. Today we found out via the Twitter account of the, of the Ohio governor that Dr. Dubia is gonna be leaving DHEC. When were you all aware? And is there a reason that she is leaving DHEC? Correct. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, so we learned of that this afternoon as well. Um, my understanding is that she has family uh, in Ohio and she's going to be closer to her family. And actually, this is a promotion for Dr. Doobie. And so we're very happy for her. We will miss her. She has been an asset to DHEC, uh, but um, understand her decision. Did you also learn via Twitter? No, no, okay. I, I learned from Dr. Doobie. So when is her last day? Um, she's going to be here for a few more weeks, um, so there's going to be a transition period. Uh, uh, it'll be a smooth transition. Who will be the next, who will be her after she leaves? So that'll be determined. That's still to be determined. On the issue of the vaccine, once it does become available, well, number one, we know that MUSC has been um, testing one of those vaccines. Have they given any kind of indication on when that vaccine may be available? Uh, not that I know of, but um, Stephen, I'm, 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 I'm not aware at this moment in time. Also on the issue of vaccines, you kind of have two, two pots of people. You have some on one side who feel like we've been rushing the vaccine and that it may not be completely ready by the time it is ready. Then you have another, you know, uh, sect of people who um, are not, are, are against vaccines in general. Um, are you concerned about both of those numbers kind of being combined and heightening Sure, the numbers of those not sure. getting it. So I'll, I'll try my best to address that as best as I can and with what ability I do have. Um, so we it, messaging is very critical um, for who can get the vaccine and when it's available. Um, and to, to your point about um, safety of vaccines, what we have heard thus far from our CDC counterparts and others on a national scale is that the vaccine will be safe and, and efficient before they push it out. And that's all that I, as far as DEC is concerned, we don't make those decisions. Today at USC, Dr. Birch said that there would be a surge testing team coming to South Carolina. Can someone explain what's going on there? Yeah, so a surge, uh, surge testing has been done across the country by um, our federal partners, and they've chosen uh, Columbia uh, to come and do surge testing which is basically they are here for uh, 12 to 14 days um, and they provide all the testing supplies up to 5,000 tests per day. And so it's a great resource, additional testing resource for, for uh, the Columbia area. And those sites are still being uh, determined. The, the, that testing should start, I believe, next week, uh, but they'll be here for several days. Um, DHEC and the University of South Carolina is gonna help uh, provide the resources um, the logistical resources for those uh, teams, but they do bring in all the testing supplies. They do all the uh, analytical uh, lab work on those, those tests. And uh, so it's a great resource and we're really appreciative of them bringing that to South Carolina. And so it will only be in Columbia or around the state? The Columbia area. It's just going to be in the Columbia area. And at this point, I, I believe they're planning for two sites in the Columbia area to be announced. Um, a third grade teacher in Richland County School District 2 has died from coronavirus. Um, have you been in contact with uh, State Superintendent Molly Spearman in terms of an action plan um, in case there are more deaths? Well, the, the school in? districts have their, have each one has their own uh, action plans. And we're, very, of course, very sorry about that. 
There was a question over there. Yeah, Governor, given this death of this 28-year-old teacher, are you worried? You asked schools to open back five days a week. Are you worried if more schools open up, we could see more Ma'am, the virus, the virus is still here. Uh, people are going to get it. Uh, the, uh, the evidence is very clear. And some of them are going to be teachers. Some are going to be students. Some are going to be maybe even some of us here. But we have to be careful, but we have to move forward. We cannot live in fear of the virus and shut down every institution in sight. It will not work and it certainly won't work here. Yes, ma'am. Um, I have two questions for uh, Director Taylor. Um, first, uh, is where's Dr. Bell? Uh, where's Dr. Bell? Uh -huh. She's working at DHAC. She's, uh, um, she's the head of our Dade area and, and she is in the middle of this response and cannot be more happy to have her there. Um, and my second question, I've spoken to a couple coroners in the past few days, and they've been saying they've had some inconsistencies with some death reportings of your numbers and their numbers. And I don't know if maybe there's an explanation on where there might be some confusion and inconsistencies between those. Well, the, the coroners get um, their information through a different stream than, than we do sometimes, which can result in, in inconsistencies. Um, and and uh, every death, the coroner is, my understanding is, the coroner is not notified of every death in the county. It's the deaths that they are involved in in the investigation. Um, and so between that and, and the lag in information, uh, sometimes related to the information that they receive and we receive can result in some inconsistencies. But we've been uh, working uh, or trying to work very closely with the coroners to get them the information that, that they need and that we can legally provide. That's another issue is that we're restricted under the law as to who we can provide certain types of information. Is, so. is there a disconnect between you, you uh, the agency and some coroners? I know um, one today in Kershaw was saying he's had a lot of trouble trying to get a hold of people at DHEC to discuss about these inconsistencies. Well, there shouldn't be a disconnect. And, and um, if there is, then, then um, I need the coroners to call me and we'll make sure that we, have, we communicate um, quickly and efficiently because the coroners are a very important part of this um, process across the state. Director, while you're up there, so Dr. Duvet's departure, how will that affect the agency's response, especially if you don't know who could be filling the role? Well, it, 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 um, it will not affect the agency's response. Um, we have uh, many qualified physicians um, still working at the agency and we have leadership uh, in the public health um, area. Uh, that, that are there now and Dr. Um, Duvey is going to be there until we determine who will take her spot. So it will be a seamless transition uh, and we will continue to respond to this event as we have um, uh, while Dr. Duvey was here and before Dr. Duvey was there. So thank you. I'm Director Taylor. This week DHEC announced that thousands of negative COVID-19 tests weren't in the database. Can you explain a little bit what happened there over the last few months, why thousands of these tests weren't in that database? Well, um, many of the tests um, we didn't receive, um, I believe there was a report um, due to a misunderstanding by many of the labs across the state as to that they should be reporting both positive and negative results to us. And uh, despite the fact that we put out um, notifications back in you know, the early parts of or the spring um, saying that that was necessary. So we have made it very clear to everyone that um, both negatives and positives are to be reported to DHAC. Um, and those are being entered into the system when we get them. And, and so that should clear up any problems going forward. Do you think that skewed the percent positive over the last few months that we've been seeing across the state? Um, I, I, I don't believe it. My understanding is it's not, won't, there's not a significant impact on that. Um, but uh, that will be determined once we receive all these results and, and we can look at the numbers going forward. Back in the back. Yes, Governor, ma you're giving all this uh, money to the schools. I did follow your uh, your guidance to move back to five days a week face to face. Is this somewhat of a punishment for those schools who maybe still need funding? No, like ma'am. It, it costs money to open open a school. You have to you have electric bills. You have to clean when the people are in there. There's a lot of expenses involved, and this is directed uh, specifically at that. And it will. We hope it will allow some more easily to open open up. This was a healthy 28-year-old teacher. How many teacher deaths is acceptable a week to continue a Zero. five days a week? No, no, no death, a teacher otherwise. It's always a tragedy. That, I didn't know the young lady. For what, what I read, she sounded like a beautiful person. It's sad. We're sorry for the family, but 
We've had a lot of people die in, in the state because of this virus, and that's the reason we're here, is to keep that number as low as possible, and zero is the acceptable number. Director, yes, ma'am. I have a question about the vaccine. Is there, a, is there a particular percentage of South Carolinians that you would want to see covered by, by the vaccine that would help bring, I mean, that would solve yeah, the I'll state's that, COVID all problems? Of them. <laughs> Okay. But that's not going to be possible at the beginning. Would you like to, Mr. White? Yeah, so that, I mean, that's a, that's a great question. And um, to Governor McMaster's point, we would love for everybody to get vaccines. However, we do understand that not all communities and not all populations do receive vaccines. So um, we will do our best to manage um, expectations for when the vaccine is available. Um, just another point is that vaccine is only indicated at this moment in time for adults, not for children. So uh, that's, that's very important um, as we're hopefully more vaccine will become available for children in time. On your list, when you say critical infrastructure employees, can you detail like who's a priority among those critical, in what's critical infrastructure? So there's a very long list that the CDC and, and CISA and, and the groups will, um, that we have a list. And so I think we can provide that information maybe on our website um, to you. It's, it's a very long list. Um, following up on that, the CDC asked states in a letter to have a distribution plan for vaccines in place by November 1st. Uh, is the HEC following that timeline in terms of expediting licenses and permitting as the CDC asked? Right. So uh, we, we are working closely with the CDC. Um, on, we're working with them on a weekly basis and sometimes even on a daily basis as new information is coming out. Um, a vaccine plan is actually going to be due to the CDC prior to vaccine allocations coming to the state, which we hope to have by the end of the month. Um, so yes, to answer your question, we will be working with CDC on our vaccination plan and they will be intricately involved. I have a question for the governor. Okay. My question is for the governor as well. Um, okay. Obviously there's you know mixed reactions with vaccines when this is available and if you can take it, would you? Would you? I don't know if I'll be one that's on the list to take when it. When it's available be, for more folks. Oh, and it's available, I, yes, I'm, and would a flu the, shot. Would the governor not be considered a priority uh, to get a vaccine? Uh, the governor's not a priority for some people. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps. <laughs> Governor, um, obviously colleges across the state have been opening up. We've seen uh, very high cases, including at the University of South Carolina. Bars in particular, bar owners in particular, have been raising some alarms. They feel like they're in a tough spot, right, because they're reopening, trying to get business in. But then at the same time, colleges have been reopening and you have just a crush of students coming in. I'm wondering, what, what is your message to particularly, you know, your University of South Carolina, Clemson, your larger schools, where the students are seeing, where the schools are seeing high numbers of, of positive cases, um, what should they be doing to help limit the, that crush? Well, they're, of they're doing it. Uh, uh, um, President Castlin at the University of South Carolina at, in, and all in Columbia as well as the regional campuses, and uh, it, uh, Jim Clements, President Clements at Clemson, and, and others are working hard on their plans. Uh, what I've encouraged them to do is is to do all they can to keep the students on campus that is not going home, to, to keep them here where, where they can be in touch with them and, and can coordinate with them and, and see that they're tested. And let me mention on, on the, the test, and we have confidence uh, in, in the, the leadership of, of all of those leaders. But uh, I would encourage everybody to get tested if, if you haven't done it. I've done it, I think, four times, two at the hands of Dr. Traxler. And uh, there's really nothing to it. And so I would encourage people, it's so widely available in our state and going to be more so when that team gets here, that it's a good time to get, get tested. And it doesn't hurt. Speaking so that, there hasn't, there's been a real drop off in people getting tested. If uh, or you or the director could address that, why have we seen such a drop off? Well, uh, we're not exactly sure, but we think some of it is testing fatigue. Um, people are, um, have been tested and, and um, the, the process um, can be uncomfortable to some, but that is actually getting better because there are new types of testing, saliva testing, also testing where you don't go all the way up in the nasal cavity, but lower in the nasal cavity. So, you know, the, the um, times of those painful tests, or not painful, but uncomfortable tests 
um, are, are hopefully soon behind us. Um, the, you know, the other thing is I think there are a lot of asymptomatic people out there walking around with the disease that don't have symptoms who don't think they need to get tested. And those are the people really that we really want to, to get tested so we know that they have the disease and that they can take the appropriate um, steps and to protect themselves and their, their family and their friends. Uh, so, um, you know, we, we are making testing widely available. It's, it's e just like the governor said, it's easy. It's um, no longer uncomfortable. Um, and so we just would request that people get out and get tested. Reporting death certificates of loved ones saying they had COVID when they were never tested or didn't show symptoms. What are you guys doing with people who maybe don't trust those death numbers because their loved one actually was never tested for COVID but it shows up on that certificate? Well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to let um, Dr. Traxler speak to um, the death certificate issues. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Director Taylor, Governor. So um, we not only take the report that we receive from healthcare facilities and healthcare providers, but we also cross-match it with, as you said, the death certificate. Um, we cross-match that death certificate then with labs um, to, to look for people who have tested positive. Um, all of the confirmed deaths that we report out have tested positive. Um, if someone is concerned um, that, that maybe the death certificate is incorrect, I would recommend that they reach out to the physician or medical provider who, who completed it and, and discuss it with them. Person did not have a test, but their certificate says COVID, but you check and they did not have a test, that number is not counted. That if those are considered probable, um, that person then, according to the death certificate and the rules of filling it out, is in the professional judgment of that medical professional, had signs and symptoms and consistent with COVID-19. Um, and so, but did not have any test performed. Those are the probable deaths. So um, there are, those do count as probable, but they do not count as confirmed question about any inklings of like the price of a vaccine, how much that would cost, and as well as for underserved or impoverished communities, would you be open to providing free vaccines for those who may not be able to afford it? Right, so when vaccine becomes available, we, um, so we currently do have some programs within DHEC that, that serve those types of populations that either don't have insurance or they're underinsured. And so at this moment in time, yes, those considerations are being taken under, under consideration. No price approximately how much it would No, cost. we don't want price or cost to be a barrier for vaccines. And Director Taylor, I have a question about saliva testing. We've seen it rolled out very successfully on USC's campus, testing a large number of students. Are there plans to roll this out widespread on the community level, and how accurate is saliva-based testing? Yes, yeah, so there are plans to roll it out statewide and make that the primary uh, way people will get tested. Um, my understanding is that the level of accuracy is almost equivalent to the PCR, the other type of testing, the nasal swab testing. Um, and we are um, actually uh, um, working with our laboratory to um, use the Yale model um, and put that in place so that we can use that model. And we're also working with USC to see if we can expand their resources so that they can take their, their testing beyond USC. So I do think that um, saliva testing is the testing of the future, um, and we are putting a lot of effort um, with our partners um, uh, into saliva testing. And when might line? that be rolled out? I'm sorry? When might that be rolled out? It's already being rolled out. Um, we, we had a testing event um, last week in Aiken um, in partnership with USC, a very small testing event, uh, but, but we are rolling that out as we speak. and so. Um, it'll be, until it's statewide, it'll be a few days, a few weeks until it's statewide, but it is getting rolled out currently. Director Taylor, what happened with that Sumter County death where we were told it was a you know, child who died, it turns out it was an 80-year-old, what happened there? So the facility entered the information um, incorrectly into the system, and so we report what is reported to us. Um, and and uh, we had questions about that, and um, actually Dr. Traxler um, if you'd like to speak to this more in more detail, she actually is the one that conducted the investigation on this. Thank you. So as Director Taylor said, it was reported to us initially as a pediatric death um, with the date of birth corresponding to that. Um, and so uh, that is what we report out. That information um, was provided to county leaderships, you know, before it went to the press uh, that day. 
we then and were already in the process of doing this investigation into the death, and through that investigation determined that the um, date of birth was keyed in inaccurately uh, into the system and into our system by the other healthcare facility. And so it was actually an elderly individual. So we um, I immediately contacted folks at DHEC, um, the governor's office and the coroner, um, coroner's office in Sumter to let them know of that. Was it the nursing home that reported the death to you? It, it was a healthcare facility. I have a, That's the last question. I have a vaccine question. Um, I, I know that you mentioned that it's not being offered right now once it becomes available to kids. Um, but I am wondering, um, you know, when it does become to children, we know that there are certain vaccines that kids need to get in order to go to school. Do you foresee um, a COVID vaccine as being a requirement by DHEC in order for kids to go to school? I don't think we've had that discussion yet. Um, Governor, or Director? So that actually is a decision by the legislature as to um, who get, who, what vaccines are required to go to school. Do you recommend that they pass that? Oh, I'm sorry. Do you recommend that they that they take that up next year and pass that? Um, I, I believe that they probably will. Um, Yo, thank you very much for coming, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. And there's the latest update from Governor Henry McMaster in the state of South Carolina. We'll have more on that update coming up on our news at 5 o'clock. We get you back to normal programming right now. And again, we'll see you in about 10 minutes from now for WJCL 22 News at 5.